Hello, and welcome to our event, Curating Beckett, a special program featuring curators and other scholars involved with the exhibition that's on this summer at the British Museum, Thomas Beckett, Murder and the Making of a Saint. I am Nina Rowe, the president of the International Center of Medieval Art, or the ICMA. And our event today was organized by the ICMA Membership Committee. I offer special thanks to Martha Easton, the chair of the ICMA Membership Committee, and to Elizabeth Morrison, who will be the host of the proceedings. I also express my gratitude to the ICMA Executive Director, Ryan Freisinger, for his administrative work, as well as to our Coordinator for Digital Engagement, that is Reagan Martin, for handling the tech side of things. And of course, I offer my enthusiastic thanks to all of our speakers today, Naomi Speakman, Lloyd DeBeer, Sophie Kelly, Rachel Koopmans, Leonie Seliger and John Jenkins. I thank them all for making time for this special event. I'm eager to get on with our program, but while I have you all captive here, I do want to take a minute in my capacity as the leader of the ICMA to encourage those of you who are not yet members to sign up with our organization, or if you're lapsed, to renew your membership. Member benefits include a subscription to our journal, Gesta, um, a subscription to our newsletter, the ICMA News. And if you're a member, you're also eligible to apply for grants and awards that we give to support scholarship or to participate in panels that we sponsor at scholarly conferences. Those are longstanding benefits of ICMA membership. But we've also been working hard for our, our members in this period when there are restrictions on gathering in person. So over the past year, we've hosted online workshop events with curators, our Mining the Collection series, and we've done online mentoring events on professional issues for students and emerging scholars. We've also put together workshops on digital tools for teaching or curating virtual exhibitions. And we've had special programs like this one. And I wanna note that we have another event coming up in about two and a half weeks. This event is called Queer Medieval Art, Past, Present and Future. That'll be a panel discussion about the historiography and new paths and challenges of incorporating queer inflected approaches in our teaching and scholarship. The discussants for that event will be Roland Betancourt, Leah Devun, Brian Keane, and Carl Whittington. And it'll take place on Monday, August 16th, from noon to 1 p.m. Eastern time. So do keep an eye out for an e-blast announcement with registration info for that. So I hope I've made a convincing pitch for joining the ICMA. It's really easy to sign up to be a member online and our standard annual membership fee is just $65. The student rate is $20. And if you sign up now, I think you'll still get both issues of Gesta for the year 2021. So it's a great deal. Um, so, but now enough of me talking, it's time to get on with today's event. I want to uh, pass things along and really it is a great pleasure to turn the screen over to Elizabeth or Beth Morrison senior curator of manuscripts at the J. Paul Getty Museum. Beth will be the MC for today's event. Take it away, Beth, thanks. Thank you, Nina. It's good to hear about the ICMA and the exciting programs to come. I am honored and delighted to introduce today's event on behalf of the ICMA. I wanted to begin by acknowledging the peoples who are the traditional caretakers of the lands where I live and work. I know that many of us, wherever we are in the world, are attending today's event from the ancestral and unceded territories of indigenous peoples, and we need to remain cognizant of that fact. Now to turn to today's ICMA event. 
I have been a staunch member of the ICMA for a quarter century and have served on its board. So I echo Nita's encouragement to become a member, or if you're already a member, to become more involved in the organization. I know that we have all been chafing at our inability to travel over the past year and a half. But events such as this sponsored by the ICMA enable us to see important exhibitions and each other during this difficult period. I myself have been looking forward to the opening of Thomas Beckett, Murder and the Making of a Saint ever since Naomi Speakman and Lloyd De Beer, both curators of the British Museum, first shared their plans with me during a visit I made to London back in 2017. For those of you who are lucky enough to live nearer than I do or are able to travel, the exhibition will be open until August 22nd. But for many, myself included, this event today will be our best opportunity to share in the exhibition with the curators. I'm terribly disappointed that I will miss seeing the exhibition in person due to travel restrictions, but I was fortunate to be able to attend the virtual opening on May 5th. Naomi and Lloyd were mesmerizing as they introduced the exhibition's main themes and some of its gorgeous objects during that grand event. And a version of that tour is now available on the British Museum's YouTube channel. The ICMA has kindly offered to send up a follow email to the event's participants with a number of links that will help you get to know the exhibition, including the link I just mentioned. But today, I look forward to going with Naomi and Lloyd behind the scenes to hear more about the making, not just of a saint, but of an exhibition. I also wanted to mention the beautiful catalog for the exhibition, which is currently on sale from Amazon, and Reagan is going to add a link to the chat where ICM members can get a discount. I hear from Lloyd that it's selling faster than expected, so make sure to get yours soon. It's bound to become a collector's item. But to return to today's program, after Naomi and Lloyd's presentations, we'll be hearing from two experts about the new findings on the Canterbury stained glass windows that are the centerpiece of the exhibition. Leonie Seliger from Canterbury Cathedral and Rachel Koopmans at York University in Toronto. I had the honor to get to know both Leonie and Rachel during the Gettys 2013 exhibition, Canterbury and St. Albans, Treasures from Church and Cloister. Leonie worked closely with the Gettys co-curators on that project, Kristen Collins and Jeffrey Weaver, on displaying the magnificent panels of Canterbury stained glass borrowed for that exhibition, and Rachel was invited to be a speaker at the accompanying symposium. Meeting the group of colleagues around that exhibition was a wonderful experience. Rounding out today's program is John Jenkins from the University of York, who will be speaking on the digital modeling of Beckett's various shrines in Canterbury Cathedral, which helps us to reconstruct and understand their medieval context. Finally, at the end of all of today's presentations, the speakers have kindly agreed to take questions, at which point we'll turn on the chat feature. We enthusiastically thank all of today's presenters in advance. A final bit of housekeeping before we begin, I wanted to mention that today's event will be recorded and we'll make it available to friends and colleagues on the ICMA website. I know that all of us are eager to turn our attention to Beckett and Canterbury, so please allow me to introduce Naomi and Lloyd. Naomi Speakman is curator of late medieval Europe at the British Museum, where she is jointly responsible for the museum's medieval collections dating from around 1100 to 1500. Following the Beckett exhibition, she will be preparing a monograph on the collecting and reception of medieval ivory sculpture in 19th century Britain. Lloyd de Beer is the Ferguson Curator of Medieval Britain and Europe at the British Museum, where he's jointly responsible with Naomi for a remarkable collection over 10,000 objects, including such treasures as the Royal Gold Cup and the Lewis Chessman. In 2021, he was awarded a three-year British Academy Wolfson Fellowship to develop a project on England and West Africa in the Middle Ages. So take it away, Naomi and Lloyd. Thanks. Well, thank you, Beth, for your kind introduction and also for chairing tonight's event. I'd like to also say thank you very much to the ICMA for hosting, especially to Nina and Martha, Ryan and Reagan, and to Rachel, Leone and John for joining us for the event today. Our thanks also go to the sponsors of the exhibition, the Hintzy Family Foundation, the Ruddock Foundation for the Arts, Jack Ryan and Zeman Paulos, and the members of the Beckett Curators Circle. Our exhibition, like all exhibitions, could not happen without the co collaboration of a whole host of colleagues from a range of institutions. And while for this event, there is not enough time to name you all, we are truly grateful to each and every one of you for your support. 
So let's turn to the exhibition. December the 29th, 2020 marked the 850th anniversary of Thomas Beckett's murder in Canterbury Cathedral. Our exhibition, Thomas Beckett, Murder and the Making of a Saint, was one of a number of events organized to tie in with the anniversary year. Instead, due to the global pandemic, all plans came to a screeching halt. Canterbury Cathedral, empty but for a few select clergy, live streamed a special service, but otherwise the day passed with little fanfare. Originally planned to open in October 2020, the exhibition was rescheduled not once, but twice, first to April and then to May 2021. It was several years in the making, but the final year of its production took place at an extraordinary time. So for our talk tonight, Lloyd and I will take you through the origins of the project, the structure and several star items from the show, and we will end with a reflection on curating in the age of COVID. Although we're overjoyed that the exhibition was able to open in the end, we're of course extremely sorry that so many international visitors are not able to travel to London to see it. And it's our hope that this event today will give you at least a taste of what is on display and we'll circulate links to a whole host of other online events you can watch on YouTube. Thomas Beckett, Murder and the Making of a Saint explores the remarkable life, death and legacy of Thomas Beckett, Archbishop of Canterbury and thorn in the side of King Henry II of England. After a protracted dispute with the King, Becket was murdered in his own cathedral by four knights from Henry's entourage. Just over two years later, he was made a saint and the rest is history. Our exhibition takes visitors through 500 years of history, beginning with Beckett's birth in London in 1120 and ending with the tumultuous years of the Tudor dynasty. But at its heart, this exhibition is about three things. The question of authority and who has the power to wield it. The consequences of standing up to tyranny and the power of unexpected events to shape the course of history. But Beckett and Henry's dispute is not simply a historical event, but it continues to resonate today. Beckett's defiance of Henry has become a touchstone for modern political disputes, such as that of James Comey, the former head of the FBI, who was in a power struggle himself with Donald Trump, or even figures such as Jamal Khashoggi or Alexei Navalny, seen by some as modern day Beckett's. And you can see on screen just a few press clippings drawing those associations. Recently here in the UK, the fallout between Boris Johnson and his special advisor, Dominic Cummings, has been reinterpreted by some on Twitter as a Beckett and Henry story for our time. Here, Johnson and Cummings heads have been superimposed over those of Peter O'Toole and Richard Burton, who played Henry and Beckett in the 1964 film. Lloyd and I first started discussing the possibility of a Beckett exhibition way back in 2015 when the British Library launched their successful Magna Carta, Law, Liberty, Legacy. That exhibition demonstrated the public appetite for medieval history and that the prospect of a major anniversary year can galvanize a project with multiple external partners. So with Beckett's 850th anniversary looming, we found that there was early enthusiasm to mark Beckett 2020 in some way. At first, our plans were more modest and small in scope, drawing purely on the British Museum's collection. But we soon realized that there was potential for something much bigger. Major UK exhibitions focusing on the period between 1100 to 1500 are few and far between. Over the past 50 years, only three have taken place at the British Museum. And you can see the posters of these on screen. Treasures of Heaven, Saints, Relics and Devotion in Medieval Europe in 2011. Westminster Kings and the Medieval Palace of Westminster in 1996. And Medieval Limoges, Masterpieces of Enamel from the Kier Collection in 1982. At a push, this could be four if we include the Treasures from San Marco show from 1984. The earlier period has fared better at the British Museum with seven exhibitions in total, 
two on the Vikings in 1980 and 2014, three on early medieval England in 1997, 1991 and 1984, and one on Celtic style metalwork in 1989, and one on the archaeology of what was then Czechoslovakia in 1982. The British Museum shows, and by extension, most other medieval exhibitions in Britain have tended to fall into one of three categories. Broadly thematic, such as Treasures of Heaven, focused on materials and techniques, such as Opus Anglicanum at the v &A in 2017, or are historical and based on a single event, such as Magna Carta at the British Library. Instead, our exhibition centres on one man, his life and legacy throughout a multi-century period. And this is more like recent shows taking place on the continent, such as Saint Louis in Paris for his 800th anniversary in 2014, or the Charlemagne exhibition in Aachen, also in 2014, for his 1200th anniversary. The driving force of our narrative in Beckett is the historical story and the way that objects bring this to life. It's one of the most famous figures from the Middle Ages and the subject of much, much scholarly study. It is surprising then that there has not been a major exhibition on him before. Beckett did feature as a small subsection on English saints focused on Beckett and Cuthbert in Treasures of Heaven in 2011. And on screen, you can see an image of what that looked like with some pilgrim badges, reliquaries and our Beckett alabaster. And you can see an image of Canterbury Cathedral Choir as a visual alongside. Let's return back to the present day and our exhibition. You can see here on screen that that same alabaster has now become the lead image for the poster. It's here on a banner in the Great Court of the British Museum. I took that about a week and a half ago. It really is lovely to see people back in the space after so many months of lockdown. Now, over to you, Lloyd. Thanks, Naomi. So the exhibition is structured in five main sections, bookended by a single object for the introduction section and for the legacy. The slide on screen shows you an overview of the space and how it's arranged. Section one, the rise and fall of Thomas Beckett, tells his life story up to his return to England from exile in December 1170. Murder in the Cathedral sits at the centre of the exhibition in a chapel-like space and takes the visitor through the days leading up to Beckett's death. Next, the making of a saint charts the 50 years following the murder, including the spread of Beckett's cult across Europe, his growing reputation as a defender of the rights of the church, and how Canterbury Cathedral was rebuilt to house Beckett's glittering shrine. The final two sections of the exhibition are broader in scope and time. The Canterbury Pilgrimage, now called Pilgrimage and Devotion, explores Beckett's cult from the 13th to the 16th century. In Beckett and the Tudors, we take a traditional turn. It begins with Henry VIII's order to outlaw the saint's name and image and explores the tumultuous years of the 1500s and the fragile survival of the cult. We end the show in the 1600s at a time when the outlook for Beckett looked bleak. This cult was kept alive through the devotion of the faithful. It is a moment where we hope visitors will pause and reflect on Beckett's remarkable story. We begin the exhibition with a delicately enameled casket on loan from the Victoria and Melbourne Museum. It was made in Limoges within 20 years of Beckett's death to contain a precious relic, and it's the largest and most magnificent of all the early reliquary caskets to survive. There's about almost 50 of these surviving. In the lower panel, three knights rush in from the left, with one slicing his sword into Beckett's neck. On the right, two monks raise their hand in horror. Above this scene are two images. To the left, a group of mourners lower Beckett's body into the tomb, while to the right, angels carry his soul up to heaven. This single object encapsulates for us the two central themes of the exhibition, Beckett's brutal death and his important legacy as a saint. As you can see on screen, we have displayed this object in front of an image of the cloister at Canterbury, which is the exact route that Beckett took to enter the cathedral prior to his murder. To the left of the basket is a quote uh, to the other left. Um, and this quote is taken from Benedict of Peterborough, who was an eyewitness to the crime and was a major figure in the posthumous construction of Beckett's cult. And we've peppered the exhibition space with um, contemporary descriptions of Beckett and, and, and quotations from some of those eyewitness accounts. 
From here, from this first object, we turn the clock back to discover how such a murder could have taken place. Given that so few objects directly connected to Becker have survived, one challenge we faced was how to bring the early story to life convincingly and through material which would have been of interest to the general public. You might be thinking this object probably won't be of interest to the general public, but it has proved so, I promise. So this is the first object that uh, visitors encounter in section one called the rise and fall of Thomas Beckett. And at first you might think it appears humble, but it is in fact a rare survivor and one that brings us very close to Beckett the man. On loan from the National Archives, this wax seal contains an image formed by Beckett's personal matrix, which he used throughout his adult life. Incredibly, for someone who produced extensive correspondence and authorized a large number of documents, this is Beckett's only surviving seal. Um, and there have been fingerprints that have been discovered at the lower left, but there's no way of proving if they're Beckett's or not because uh, no other survivor we can match them up with. Measuring just a few centimeters in diameter, the impression reveals aspects of Beckett's character. The legend, Sigillum Tome Lund, tells us that this is the seal of Thomas of London. He probably had the matrix made before he was appointed chancellor or archbishop when his title was changed to reflect his new status. For the center, Beckett selected a beautiful Roman gem engraved with a standing figure, possibly that of Apollo. This reveals Beckett's interest in the classical world and his choice of a fine ancient intaglio communicated to his peers that he was a learned man of the moment. Beckett's murder sits at the heart of the exhibition. Here, an immersive animation takes visitors through the drama of his final days. On screen, you can see a photo from the space showing the final shot of the animation. And this shows just after Beckett's been murdered and this blood kind of covers the screen with this quote from I wouldn't say that's going to go nights, this fellow will not be up again. We decided to show only one object in this space, a manuscript from the British Library, which contains one of the earliest known images of the murder. It dates from the mid 1180s and is from a collection of correspondence related to Beckett and Henry's dispute. I'm showing the um, opening here on the screen with the detail. It's a lively and dramatic scene, and it's remarkable for the illuminator's attention to detail. Above, the Archbishop's dinner is interrupted by the arrival of the four knights. Below, to the left, in the cathedral, he is struck in the head by two of them. Reginald Fitzurse, who is one of the murderers, is identified by his shield and plays in with the head of a bear. A small fragment of Beckett's bloody crown and that of a broken sword point fall to the ground between the Archbishop and his attackers. Behind is the loyal clerk, Edward Grimm, who is wounded in the arm by one of the sword blows. To the right, we see pilgrims kneeling before Beckett's tomb. The next section of the exhibition, called The Making of a Saint, includes two special loans which have never traveled to the UK before. Each one demonstrates Beckett's early popularity across Europe. The first is a font made around 1191 for the church of Lundkjö, at the time part of Den Denmark, now in southern Sweden. And you can see a detail from the font on the screen going up on the right, and you can see the font uh, on display in the exhibition to the left. The carving, the detail that we're showing on the right, shows how Henry II's role in the crime was perceived internationally. Around the bowl are five Christological scenes and this unusual depiction of Beckett's martyrdom. It begins with Henry, as you can see on the screen, ordering the knights to go to Canterbury. He is shown enthroned and he's named by a scroll that projects from out of his hand, bearing the words Rex and Lucas. He points towards a knight who turns to join the other three who have already begun their attack. This is, of course, an image would be very difficult to show in England because it directly implicates the king in the, in the uh, ordering of the murder. Nearby is a golden casket made in Bergen around 1220 and on loan from Hedalen Stave Church in Norway. This object looks completely spectacular, glowing under the lights and drawing the eye of the visitor from across the country. The lower panel shows Beckett's martyrdom with five knights attacking the archbishop. It's remarkable for its similarity to the early manuscript image of the murder that I've just shown from Cotton Cold SP2 at the center of the, the murder section. We can see here the sword point and the skull fragment, or perhaps a cap in this instance, falling to the floor between the knights. Even more remarkable are these two dragon's heads that project from the sides of the lid, looking very much like the wooden stave church in which this object is housed. 
The most extraordinary loan of the exhibition is, of course, an entire window of stained glass from Canterbury Cathedral, one of Beckett's miracle windows made to surround the shrine in the early 13th century. And I show the image on the right of the glass that we borrowed from Canterbury, and you can see it in situ to the left, just, um, um, I don't know if my cursor is coming up, this, this uh, image here. This is the first time it has ever left the cathedral and it provides a unique opportunity for visitors to see these images close up as never before. You will be hearing all about this class and current and future research from Rachel and Leonie. So we'll let you uh, let them tell you more, but we wanted to show you a before and after installation shot here. So this was the um, before shot of the uh, when we were installing the glass and when Leonie's team installing the glass and this is how it looks with probably uh, that image. I'd also like to just take an opportunity to say thank you to all of our colleagues, our amazing colleagues at Canterbury, uh, particularly Leonie um, and of course Rachel, who really wouldn't have been able to, to do this exhibition with you. A section on pilgrimage and devotion comes after the glass. For hundreds of years, pilgrims from across Europe traveled to Canterbury to show their devotion to St. Thomas. The most famous of these pilgrims are of course Geoffrey Chaucer's fictional pilgrims from the Canterbury Tales. Chaucer's poem was that unfinished, and his characters never quite made it to Canterbury. Before those real pilgrims arriving at the cathedral, it must have been an otherworldly experience. The church would have been filled with the sounds of chanting, the smell of incense, and there were breathtaking works of art to see, not least Beckett's extraordinary jewel-encrusted shrine. Many of these pilgrims took away a souvenir from their journey in the form of a badge, and you can see several of these badges on screen here. Um, this wonderful image of Beckett on horseback. And um, an image of the murder weapon, which I know is, is being disputed that these were in fact badges of the murder weapon, but interesting nonetheless. In the 16th century, Beckett found himself again at odds with the crown. This time it was King Henry VIII. In the final section, Beckett and the Tudors, we explore how Beckett's shrine was destroyed and his cult outlawed. But those opposed to these changes kept the saint's memory alive. One of the few pieces of the shrine to have survived is this pink marble capital, which was found in the River Stour in Canterbury in 1984, and is loaned to us from Canterbury Museums and Galleries. And I actually had a letter from um, the wife of the gentleman who discovered this in 1984 whilst walking his dog. Um, so I had that to, um, well, given as a letter to the object of Canterbury Museums. And this, this object is shown alongside a digital reconstruction, which John Jenkins will talk you through later on. We end the exhibition with these two objects, and they show how, despite the tumultuous years of the 1500s, Beckett endured. Wrapped in red velvet and secured with golden thread, the relic on the left is one of the few surviving relics associated with Beckett. It is held inside a gilded reliquary, it's only about uh, this big, engraved with the words ex cranio sancti tome cantuariensis from St. Thomas of Canterbury's skull. The relic was probably smuggled out of England by a Catholic in the last decades of the 1500s, doing so at great personal risk. It was taken to the Jesuit College of St. Omer, where it was protected, and in 1666, a shining silver statue of Beckett was made to hold it. You can see this, this uh, statue on the right. You might also be able to see, if you look closely, these two holes at the breast of the figure, which allow the reliquary to be attached. It has two small pins at the back. Held aloft on a staff, the ensemble was probably carried in religious processions and served as a material reminder of the ongoing resistance to royal authority, connecting the moment of Beckett's medieval martyrdom with the fragile survival of his cult throughout the time of early modern persecution. I'm going to hand back to Naomi to end. Thank you, Lloyd. And in fact, here is Lloyd on screen looking at the Hadal and Stave casket with his face mask on. So to finish then, we wanted to reflect, or in fact, I will be reflecting briefly on our experience of curating the show in the age of COVID. On the 16th of March, 2020, the museum closed its doors to the public and instructed all but essential staff to work from home. This was soon followed by a national lockdown and a period of furlough for almost all the employees of the British Museum. After informing our lenders and partners of our plans, all curatorial work on Beckett was temporarily suspended until we returned to work in August of 2020. So Lloyd and I were also furloughed. 
On coming back to work, we were aware of the need to adapt the exhibition from what it had been pre-COVID to meet the challenges of our new and unexpected situation. This required several things. Firstly, it required a redesign of the exhibition to open up the space and enable social distancing to the best of our ability. What you can see on screen is the layout of the exhibition as it is today. There were some obvious practical measures that uh, you simply can't do once there's a pandemic on, such as no interactive features with touch screens or listening posts. And cases were spaced apart so that visitors could, in theory, move from one to the other without getting too close to each other. With great difficulty, we slimmed down our object list and reduced the overall word length of all the panels and labels. So the hope here was to avoid bottlenecks and to encourage visitor flow throughout the gallery. The other main challenge was that we were all suddenly, like everyone else, working from home and divorced from the objects which were going into the exhibition and divorced from all of our libraries. So we had to learn quite quickly to work flexibly and creatively. And this slide shows one of the ways we tried to do that. On the left is a photo I took of my desk at home. And on the right is a photo Lloyd took in situ in the British Museum. And this is one way we tried to do the layout of the Pilgrim Badge case, uh, which was conducted remotely. So I cut out images of every object and moved them around on my desk whilst Lloyd and colleagues were moving the physical objects around. As we were not able to meet up with them in person, our designers also received endless drawings and doodles of varying quality, like the one you can see on screen. And the intention here was to help them to understand the case layouts as we saw them and how mounts should be constructed. In practice, this did not always go to plan. And come March 2021, when we began installing the show, we needed to make on the spot adjustments once we had the objects in front of us. So here on the screen are two images and on the left, uh, this is us installing three Beckett Pilgrims flasks from the British Museum collection. And on the right, uh, we're holding a discussion with colleagues around the best way to display this 16th century surgical instrument case. I should say also that John and a colleague of his, uh, Louise Hampson, have very recently just this week published an article on this case. So do look out for that. Uh, it's important to get angles and mounts absolutely right. The flasks, for example, have minute details that needed the right mount angle and lighting for visitors to see them properly. And this was the same for the instrument case, which has a small but detailed image of Beckett's martyrdom on the reverse. And that can be very difficult to see if it's shown at the incorrect angle. So here is another one of our doodles and it shows the mount maker exactly what we felt was needed. And the final result of this is on the right with the case in situ today. An exhibition is usually also accompanied by a grand opening ceremony and a large public programme. With COVID cases as, as they have been, this was simply not possible. And we also had to adapt to a full digital opening and transferring our public programme online. And the images you can see on screen are both from the uh, digital opening. On the right is the curator's tour that Lloyd and I filmed. And on the left, I'm sitting with our deputy director in front of the glass for a live Q&A session. The benefit with these has been that more people than ever before have been able to engage with our events, but paradoxically, fewer people can physically come. All the events, including our curator's introduction, on the, are on the British Museum's YouTube channel, and they're all freely available. So, it certainly increased our access to the exhibition. So the exhibition opened on the 20th of May and incredibly, there are just three weeks left until it closes. We have been blown away by the positive press and feedback from visitors on screen are just a few clippings of press reviews. Given that the year that we have just had, we were unsure of how many visitors would return to the museum. But so far, I'm pleased to say it has been phenomenally successful with many days being sold out. This shows that there continues to be a healthy appetite for medieval exhibitions, and it is our hope that it bodes well for more to come in the future. So thank you, and back to you, Beth.
Thank you, Naomi and uh, Lloyd, for that fabulous um, sort of whirlwind tour through the exhibition. It makes me even sadder that I'm not there to witness it in person, but I thank you so much for um, sharing it uh, through these means with the ICMA. Um, now we're going to be looking more closely at the stained glass that Naomi and Lloyd spoke about, and our presenters today are Leonie Seliger and Rachel Koopmans. Um, Leonie Seliger is the director of the stained glass studio at Canterbury Cathedral. She and her team of conservators are responsible for the care of the cathedral's internationally important collection of medieval stained glass. The collection includes stained glass windows dating from the first half of the 12th century to the late 15th century, and also from the 19th to the 21st century. Rachel Koopmans is Associate Produ uh, Professor of Medieval History at York University in Toronto. She is writing a new catalog of the Thomas Beckett Miracle Windows of Canterbury Cathedral for the Corpus Vitriarum with the assistance of Leone Seliger at Canterbury. She is also currently completing the first English translation of Benedict of Peterborough's collection of Beckett's Miracles, which served as the chief source text for the medieval glaciers of the Miracle Windows. So now I'm going to turn it over to Leonie and Rachel. Welcome. Well, thank you very much, <clears throat> um, Beth, for that kind introduction. And um, I am truly honored to have been invited uh, to contribute to this exciting event. I would like to express my thanks to Naomi Speakman, Lloyd Beer, and all the wonderful British Museum staff who've made this project such a great success and so much fun to put together. Most of all, I would like to thank Rachel Koopmans, whose deep understanding and knowledge of Beckett's miracles and generosity in sharing her expertise has changed my own understanding of the miracle windows completely. And I know we both look forward to lots of comments and questions from the participants. So don't hold back. Um, I thought it would be worth giving a look behind the scenes to uh, show how this, this spectacular display was put together and the opportunities it presents and the legacy it will leave with Canterbury Cathedral. Um, there we go. Stained glass is perhaps the most underrepresented art form in museum settings. This has several reasons and I will only mention a few of them. Stained glass can be an attention stealer. Note how at the uh, Tate Gallery's exhibition, uh, Art Under Attack, uh, the wonderful Thomas Johnson's painting of the interior of Canterbury Cathedral's choir looks incredibly drab compared to the two backlit panels from the second typological window, which is actually depicted in Johnson's painting. Having to deal with large expanses of brightly lit stained glass can be extremely difficult to manage when other exhibits are housed in glass cases. The reflections in this example take over the visual experience of the space completely and make it almost impossible to see some of the other exhibits. Where light sensitive materials are displayed together with stained glass, concerns over the exposure limits can affect the whole display. Some of you may remember the exhibition at the J. Paul Getty Museum curated by Jeffrey Weaver and Kristen Collins, where several of Canterbury Cathedral's 12th century ancestors of Christ were on the show next to the disbound St. Albans Psalter, which you can actually spot in the foreground here. To deal with the problem of reflections, the display cases were, for the Psalter pages were tilted away from the stained glass and that worked very well. And by reducing the illumination levels of the stained glass to a minimum, the conservation concerns voiced by the manuscript conservators could be addressed sufficiently. The ancestors then moved on to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. We flew from a balmy Los Angeles into a truly epic New York snowstorm, which was an interesting experience. Tim Husband's design team decided upon an entirely different approach to that of the Getty. Rather than treating the stained glass as displays on a wall, they created a hugely impressive architectural setting for them. Built inside the Romanesque hall at the cloisters, 
This buttressed tower allowed the stained glass to assert its nature as an architectural and monumental art form. The Met very kindly shared their construction drawings with us so that we could adapt their idea for another exhibition, this time in the chapter house at Canterbury Cathedral. So having dealt with the problems of domineering, overreaching and potentially damaging displays of stained glass, we now need to mention cost. There really is very little comparison between hanging a painting on a wall and building a support structure that includes light boxes and the precision engineered metal framework to hold the stained glass panels in place. This tower, which housed 17 large 12th and 13th century figures, cost somewhere in the region of 90,000 pounds in 2015, using only in-house labor and not counting the metal frames that had already been made for the exhibitions in the United States. So here is the core of the tower, and here is the fully clad tower with the stained glass installed. Actually, our works department manager blanched and walked out of the room when I showed him what I had planned for him to build. But he did a fantastic job and um, I think it was worth every penny. So, um, of course, we must not forget the cost and inconvenience of scaffolding. Here is the Beckett Miracle Window N3 in the Trinity Chapel with the first panels being removed for the exhibition at the British Museum. And we do that very simply by taking them out of their um, metal support structure. Thankfully, many of our medieval windows in the cathedral are already set into protective glazing systems, which means that we do not make a hole in the building when we remove the individual stained glass panels from the window. You can see here that the historic stained glass is set into an inner metal support frame this year. Um, the original medieval framework, which you can spot through the gap, um, houses the protective glazing panels, the colorless glass divided up with lead strips into largest pieces of clear glass. That now takes the brunt of the weather. That inner support frame, by the way, dates to the early 1980s and is going to be replaced with a new frame made specially for the exhibition in the British Museum. And while the stained glass is on show in London, visitors to Canterbury Cathedral make do with photos of the glass. Here is one of my colleagues installing a sheet of choroplast with a thin photographic transparency attached to it. That actually looks surprisingly convincing and it allows our guides to still tell the stories of the miracles to our visitors. Now, in order to make the support frames for the exhibition, we had to first find a space large enough to set out the window to its full height of six meters. The only space available turned out to be on top of the safety deck that is currently in place in the cathedral nave. It was put there to enable works to the clerestory windows and to the vaults and the roof, but it turned out to be a very useful drawing floor for us. You can see here two of my colleagues setting out the template for the new frame using rubbings and cardboard templates to ensure an exact fit. Trust me, two millimeters variance is unacceptable. The new frame was made in brass by a local fabricator to the specialized tolerance of one millimeter. Remember the whole height of the window is six meters, so there's not a lot of tolerance here. On the left, my colleague Grace, who set out the frame, uh, stands proudly in the assembled uh, array. And on the right, two very proud fabricators delivered the new frame in four sections to our workshop in Canterbury. Now, talking about COVID, thankfully, we were all able to carry on with this work because our work is classed as construction and construction workers were allowed to carry on. The next step was to trial fit the stained glass panels into the frame sections and to manufacture saddle bars to support the glass laterally. Those of you who actually managed perhaps to get to the exhibition in London physically, do look for the 
um, the engineering of that, that framework, you can actually see these saddlebars and lugs and wedges dotting the surface. It's quite a beautiful uh, construction system. Now at this stage, we were able to test out if panels of the same shape could be swapped from one location within the window to another. And it turned out that this was indeed possible without having to make alterations to the historic material. That then gave us an opportunity, which Rachel will talk about in a minute. So having made the new brass frame in four sections, we could then display the window at the British Museum, not as one huge entity with the top almost out of sight, but spread out into four segments, each at eye level. The casing that houses the stained glass and its brass frames forms part of the exhibition architecture, rather ingeniously echoing the curve of the Trinity Chapel, only inverted. Um, so I really liked that, that design by the British Museum's uh, designers. That was a very uh, good idea, I think, to introduce that architectural element. And here we are just installing the panels into the display. It takes quite a lot of pairs of hands to make sure that that's done safely, as you can see. And here's the installation almost finished in its own dedicated section of the exhibition space at the British Museum. The new brass frames will come back to Canterbury after the exhibition ends to be redeployed in the Trinity Chapel. They will replace the aging and frankly, very unsuitable and anachronistic aluminium T-section frames. In the process, we will be able to markedly improve the physical effectiveness of the protective glazing system, which is currently not performing as well as it should. And with that, I hand over to Rachel, who will tell you about the super exciting discoveries we've made and the question we now face as a result. Well, thank you so much, uh, Leonie. I hope that you can all see my screen at this point. I'll just add my thanks to um, everyone who made this exhibition possible. Um, for someone who is trained as a, as a plain old historian and not an art historian to be involved with this exhibition is really um, something I never even dreamed I would get to be able to do. And it's been marvelous. Um, and also let me say that none of this work on the glass really would have been possible without um, Leonie's help. So um, I'm very grateful for, for all her work with me, a, a humble historian all these years. So what I'd like to do now is look in more detail at this window, at its imagery, and some of the questions that we now face as the um, glass comes back from the exhibition. So the glass dates to the early 13th century, it is one of 12 that surround the former site of Thomas Beckett's shrine. And the idea of this window was to display stories of Beckett's miracles. Um, now, this, um, again, let, let me just say that while the, the glass as a whole um, late, dates to the early 13th century, there is one intruder panel here that dates to the um, mid 1180s, so a few decades earlier. And there's also glass here that dates to the mid 19th century. So how that came about, um, I'd like to take you to our very first, one of our very first visual records of this glass and it dates to the 19th century and it is this. So um, we have no written um, description of the window that dates before the 19th century, nor do we have any um, visual record that dates before this. And you can see that what we have um, in this painting of the Trinity Chapel in 1855 is a record of the fact that the bottom roundel at this point was uh, devoid of colored glass. So at this point, it only had plain glazing in it. 
And you can see that these other windows here on the Trinity Chapel aisle also were had lost their bottom roundels. Now people tend to think that this damage happened during the Reformation, but we think in the case of the Trinity Chapel at Canterbury Cathedral, this was the result of iconoclasm during the English Civil War in the 17th century. And Leonie showed you a shot of this um, painting on the wall of the Tate exhibition. What it shows us are commissioners sitting in the choir of Canterbury Cathedral. And you can see one little man there on the right on, on the sill of a choir aisle window smashing out the panels. So we think it was at this point that the bottom, bottom panels in the Trinity Chapel were knocked out. Why they only did the bottom panels, um, we, we don't know and probably never will. Um, but what we do know is that there was a rough and ready restoration that happened in the 1660s during the restoration. And at that point, um, it appears that panels were kind of plopped back willy nilly into the cathedral. And we know that because of the records made by this man, George Austin Jr., who restores and rearranges this window in 1857. Now, this was a part of a uh, restoration and really um, creation of new glass as well for Canterbury Cathedral. And he gets to this particular window in 1857. And we're extraordinarily fortunate that for this window and actually for this window only, he made, we have a surviving plan that he made of where the glass was as before, placed before restoration as he wrote himself on this little um, chart that he made. And then he explained in this report, and again, he probably wrote these reports for all the windows, but we only have this one surviving. He wrote that he appended another plan, as you can see there, showing the arrangement of the medallions so as to bring into harmony the different phases of the stories illustrated and the new medallions and lights furnished to complete the window. So here, it's clear that he, when he, when he looked at this window, he realized that the stories were not in reading order, that the miracles couldn't be read as they were meant to be read by the medieval glaciers because these panels had been put back, um, put back in, in a disordered state. And if we look then at the pre-1857 arrangement, which we know from his plan, and the post-1857 1857 arrangement, so his arrangement, you can see how much he reordered. And I'd just like to say thanks to Lanny for this and, and other slides that I'm using in this presentation. So for instance, this panel, which he found at the top of the window, he moved all the way to the bottom. This panel, he moved to the middle. And this panel, he moved to the top. And he really, he swapped all but two panels, all but two panels he moved to different places. So it really was a, a very significant rearrangement. And he also then supplied new glass, which we have there just in black to um, just to simplify things. But then he made new panels, copying other panels and other windows to make the window look complete. Now the window has not been reordered since 1857. So the glass has come out um, more than once during the wars it came out. It also came out for cleaning, but it, has, it retains Austin's 1857 ordering. And here is an identification of the scenes according to Madeline Kavnis's monumental um, CVMA catalog. And what you can see here and what Lainey has done for us here is to color code the stories for us. And when we look now at what Austin did, it really is quite impressive. Um, I'm gonna put some smiley faces where we think he got it absolutely right. So here at the bottom, the stories that tell about a monk named Hugh of Gervaux um, up in Yorkshire, we think he got that spot on, put those together in the correct order. Um, these panels, uh, the Daughters of Godbold of Boxley, although we now call them the Lame Sisters of Boxley narrative, he also nailed, got those in the correct order. He also got almost all of the L word story correct. So you can see there in red, um, this is um, the, the most famous miracle, not just in this window, but in fact, of all the early Beckett cult. And it's the miracle of a blinded and castrated peasant who is healed through Beckett's merits. So again, when you, when you think of what 
Austin walked into here really is quite impressive. He was able to, to nail these narratives, but certainly questions still remain. And so um, I put question marks there on, on problematic panels and um, Madeline herself put question marks on many of these panels in terms of um, what, what do they represent and, and do they belong uh, where they are? And what I want to tell, talk to you about, um, I've done a lot of research on, on this window, but we want to just focus on some breakthrough discoveries we made in the middle of the pandemic in the, um, the mid-September 2020. And they had to do with the panels that I've boxed for you there. So the, the Cure of Leprosy panel, kind of smack in the middle of the window, and then two panels at the top of the window. Now here's that cure of leprosy panel. And the reason this has been problematic is that it's, it's definitely got the word leprosy in the, in the inscription. But if you look at the, the image itself, it's of a man leaving a city. Um, it actually is very well preserved, but the guy does not seem to be a leper. So there's been questions, do, does this inscription belong in this panel? Might this even have come from a different window? Um, what is a leper doing in the middle of this window that doesn't seem to have a leper otherwise in it? And so in September, Leonie um, emailed me and we talked via Skype and said that she had some time in her schedule and some money to work on the glass, which was at that point out of the window and in the cathedral studio. And she wondered if there were any panels I thought she should take an especially close look at. And so I thought of this panel and wondered, is it possible that there might be a leper somewhere else in the window? And suggested that she have a look at those problematic panels at the top of the window. And when she looked at this particular panel, um, I have to say, I, I didn't quite expect this myself, but when she looked closely at it, um, and looked at this man who is sitting here having his leg bathed and is being offered some of the Beckett relic water to drink. So he's being bathed with it and he's being offered some to drink. Here's what she found when she looked at very closely at the leg. Um, what she found were, as you might expect, dots which are corroded, corrosion. So um, the glass corrodes slowly over all the centuries. And um, these dots, the corrosion dots are really common throughout the whole sequence. But what she's also able to find are painted dots. And that's what you see circled in red. And painted dots are signs that, the, um, that, that this man has leprosy. So that's what the glaciers did. We've got two other sets of panels that show um, lepers in the window. And this is how the Glaciers showed that someone had leprosy by painting dots all over them. And, she, and Lainey was able to confirm by putting this under the microscope that these were indeed painted dots and that this fellow does have leprosy. Um, and and uh, there were apparently shouts of joy in the, um, in the studio, even though I was back in Toronto and couldn't hear them. Now, this is something Lainey hasn't even seen. This is something I, I discovered yesterday, but um, Austin Jr. himself made a copy of this particular panel and put it into a parish church um, in Kent. And if you look carefully at this, you can see that he did not spot those leper spots. He did not put any kinds of spots on the seated fellow. And in fact, he seems to have thought that he was a monk. So he made, gave him a tonsure in this window. So this is something that, that Austin did not spot that nobody else who's looked at this um, panel has spotted until Lainey found it in mid September. So again, no dots on that seated figure's skin. So by finding the dots, what Lainey had discovered was the key to putting not just these two panels together, but these three panels together. So, um, I knew from my knowledge of the miracle stories of a story that fitted these panels perfectly. It's the story of a man named Ralph who came to Canterbury and there he washed with the Beckett relic water and drank it for nine days straight. But he left without sensing improvement. It was only when he left Canterbury, as we see him there on his horse leaving the city, that he then felt his cure. And so that's why we see a cured man leaving the city with his hands up in gratitude. 
He then came back to the tomb and gave thanks for his cure. And that last panel, Austin mistakenly um, restored with a woman's head. So he did not know who this represented. That head was probably in some state of disrepair and he supplied a woman's head. But in fact, it must be the last story in Ralph's panel. And if we just put a man's head there, no, we haven't done this in reality, but just via Photoshop, you can see that sure enough, this man is dressed exactly the same in all three panels. Now, this also solved another problem that uh, Lainey had brought up to me years before, which is the presence of these monsters, these wyverns, um, mythical beasts on the top of this panel. And she asked me, Rachel, what are wyverns doing on the top of the panel? And I had no idea <laughs> at that point, but now we do know. And the reason is this, at the end of Ralph's story, um, Benedict of Peterborough, who wrote down his, his uh, story in Latin, noted that after Ralph left, after giving his Thanksgiving, quote, I do not know by what hidden judgment of God, he was seen to be leprous to such a degree that no one ever existed more fouled by the contagion of leprosy. So what those wyverns are doing there for us is I think it's kind of a private joke by the glaciers to say this guy is going to be hit with leprosy again. So then to summarize these discoveries, what we found was that this panel belongs with these two panels. And what we need to do then is swap out that one for the writer panel. And now I don't have time. I, if I had another 20 minutes, I would now discuss why we think this panel actually belongs exactly where that writer panel is or it was. Um, and here I have to eat a little crow because in a guest article, I argued for a different placement and a different uh, story for this panel, but now I think I'm wrong. I think that it does belong with the L word of Westoning panel, or, sorry, Westoning story. So again, that panel needs to go up there and this panel needs to go down there to complete the original ordering of the narrative so that you read it as the medieval glaciers would want us to read it. So we discovered this in mid-September and the exhibition was coming up in April. So now the question was what to do and there was much discussion. Um, the first thing we did was to decide um, to change the description of these panels within the exhibition book. And we were kind of just in time for that. It was kind of in the final copy editing um, phase. And let me just give my thanks to Lydia, the copy editor for giving us the opportunity to, to change that description before the book went to press. Then the next big question was how to display the panels at the British Museum. Could we reunite the lepers panels and should we reunite them? So could we was the first big question and that's where Lanny and her team did a lot of very careful measuring of that frame and of the panels to make sure that if we swap them that they could fit in there with no damage and they were able to to determine we could do it, then should we reunite them? We eventually decided we should. Um, and Lainey then went through two more steps to, um, to kind of ensure that, that it was okay to do that. And the first was to contact the Cathedral's Fabric Commission. Now they have to okay any kind of reordering of fabric or change to fabric in a grade A listed building like Canterbury Cathedral is. And they told her that for a temporary exhibition, there would be no need for their permission. And then the chapter of Canterbury Cathedral, which has the authority over the fabric of the cathedral was also contacted. And this request was made to reorder and they agreed to that in December, 2020. Then the next stage of the drama really was um, the British Museum press launch, which happened in late January, 2021. And it was at that point that the world was told that the window would be leaving the cathedral for the first time for this exhibition. And also then this added um, story that the panels would be reordered. And it was very gratifying to see that many of the headlines um, took up this question of reordering. And that, that the journalists and, and the editors of these papers and news outlets thought that that would be a story that, um, that their readers would find interesting. And it really became um, uh, significant news, significant news. 
Then in the installation in 2021, um, the leper story there is back in order. And I have to say, it makes me happy just, just looking <laughs> at that picture to see these, order, uh, these panels um, back together after so long, really since the mid 17th century. So now is the big question that looms. Um, should the panels, how should the panels be displayed in the cathedral after the exhibition ends? So should we preserve Austin Jr.'s arrangement of 1857? Or um, assuming that our upcoming research supports our findings, should we reorder? So I should be back in Canterbury in September. I have 10 weeks, um, 10, 11 weeks in which Lainey and I will do an intensive investigation of this glass and assuming that that work supports these findings and then assuming that um, we get the required permissions through all the different committees, is it a good idea? Should we reorder? And if so, by how much? Now, here's Austin's 1857 ordering, just to remind you. So one option would be to swap those two panels. So to swap um, the Elward panel and the Ralph panel so that those stories can be read um, in, in, in the correct reading order. So if we did that, this is how it would look, okay? So if we, we simply swapped those two panels. But there's another option. Um, what if we also, in addition to doing that kind of swap, what if we also move the 19th century replacement glass that was supplied by George Austin Jr. to the top of the window so that the medieval glass is easier to see. So that would mean swapping these two panels, these two, these two, and these two. So that again, we move the 19th century replacement glass to the top and move medieval glass to the bottom. And if we did that, this is how the window would look. Now, um, the, the one thing that's kind of comforting in thinking about this is we would not do this if it entailed any kind of damage to the glass and it should be fully reversible. So if someone in 10 or 50 or 100 years times comes back and says this is incorrect, it would be possible to reverse it without any damage to the glass. The other advantage would be moving to moving some of this glass to the, the bottom of the window is that um, this uh, panel, which would then be at the bottom, is this one intruder panel that dates to the um, mid 1180s. And it'd be marvelous if that could be um, right in people's eyesight. It's a really important panel that shows um, a gifting of Beckett's garments to the poor immediately after his martyrdom. And what I've also noticed is that the bottom panel of, of all of these miracle windows is the one that gets um, photographed. And the bottom panel in this window I have seen reproduced in many places where you would hope it wouldn't be. Um, so currently we have an Austin replacement that gets photographed and reproduced as 13th century glass when it in fact is not. So I'll, I'll wrap it up here and just to say that we are really very interested and would in your thoughts and any of your reactions to this question of reordering. Um, we're, we're seeing this as kind of an information gathering exercise and we'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, but with that, I'll turn it back to Beth. Thanks so much, um, Rachel. Super, super exciting discoveries and what I love about the, the story that you and Leone um, told together is the way that conservators and historians and art historians can work together for really significant results in a kind of collaborative way that I think is a model for moving forward um, in our various professions. So um, now we're going to uh, be hearing the last part of today's presentation uh, by John Jenkins about the shrines associated with Thomas Beckett in the later Middle Ages. John Jenkins is Assistant Director of the Center for Pilgrimage Studies at the University of York. His recent publications include articles on digitally remodeling the Shrine of Thomas Beckett and Beckett's Cult in Medieval London, as well as a co-edited volume entitled Pilgrimage and England's Cathedrals. 
He has recently completed a parallel text edition and translation of the 1428 Customary of the Shrine of Thomas Beckett, uh, which will be appearing next year. So without further ado, I will turn it over to John. Oh, thanks, Beth. Um, yes, and uh, this is a, I, I'll ex also extend my, my thanks and my congratulations to everyone involved in the exhibition. Um, it's been a real privilege to see it sort of come together over the last few years. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, one small part of it that I've been involved in, which is uh, a digital reconstruction of the medieval shrine of Thomas Beckett. And I mean, we've just seen a very collaborative effort. This is a very collaborative effort as well. Um, between historians and uh, art historians, architectural historians, um, people on the floor at Canterbury Cathedral and digital modeling teams as well. Um, people involved in so animators, modelers, uh, and uh, various aspects of the digital humanities. Now, as we've seen in the medieval period, Thomas Beckett was a major saint all over Europe. Uh, the heart of his cult um, uh, was at Canterbury Cathedral, where after 1220, his body lay for three centuries in a golden shrine. This was one of the most famous uh, pilgrimage destinations in Christendom, and surely no understanding of Beckett's popularity would be complete without an understanding of this central element. The problem with this is that the shrine was totally destroyed by Henry VIII's men in 1538, uh, and the space left to left stand empty, now populated only by a single lit candle marking the site of the shrine. How then do we fill this space? How do we make sense of how it would have looked, how it would have been experienced when it held one of medieval Europe's most important and impressive shrines? How do we present that to a modern audience, both within the cathedral and in this case more widely at the British Museum? Modern digital modeling technology for the first time really allows us to do this in a way which more accurately than ever before reconstructs not just the appearance, but the feel, the experience of the space. And this is a sort of new direction as well in reconstruction. We're not just thinking about architectural forms, we're really thinking about senses and we're thinking about um, experience. I've got a feeling this might be a George Austin Jr. Sorry about that, Rachel. <laughs> but, um, it's just illustrative. Um, at Thomas Beckett's death in 1170, his body was quickly buried in a grave in the crypt of Canterbury Cathedral. A marble box was placed on top with holes in the sides for pilgrims to place their heads in and kiss the gravestone. That's what you can see there, a foramina tomb as it's known. This was only ever intended as a short term situation because as soon as it was clear that Thomas Beckett was a saint, something that was patently obvious even before his official 1173 canonization, the monks of Canterbury planned to move his body to a more exalted lo location and setting in the upper church of the cathedral. In 1174, fire ripped through the east end of the cathedral, destroying the choir. This was a blessing in disguise, as it allowed the upper church to be rebuilt with Beckett's shrine setting in mind. You can see above the previous uh, pre-1174 cathedral and below that great expansion, uh, Beckett's shrine is in that uh, sort of the upside, the upside end before the apse at the, at the terminal apse, which is a, now known as the Trinity Chapel. Um, the new chapel of St Thomas of Canterbury, which we now call the Trinity Chapel, was purpose built at the highest and easternmost point of the cathedral, forming a backdrop to the high altar, and Beckett's shrine was to be placed in the middle. Although the architectural setting for the shrine was probably completed by 1185, a series of disputes between the monks and the archbishops, and then the monks and King John, prevented the translation of the remains from taking place. It was not until 1215 that Archbishop Stephen Langton was able to seriously put in motion the necessary steps for the translation to happen, including the construction of the golden and bejeweled casket that would contain Beckett's remained, remains. Langton planned the event with precision, picking a date, the 7th of July 1220, that respected the biblical idea of the Jubilee anniversary from Beckett's martyrdom and putting on a ceremony which was one of the greatest events of the medieval English church, attended by royalty, nobility, and ecclesiastical dignitaries from all over Europe. So here's the first look at our reconstruction of the shrine. I'll show it again later. Um, 
From 1220 until its destruction at the hands of Henry VIII's men in 1538, the majority of Thomas Becket's remains were in this golden shrine at the east end of Canterbury Cathedral. It was one of the wonders of the medieval world. Pilgrims came from all over Europe to venerate Becket and to see the shrine, and eyewitness accounts from even the most well-travelled pilgrims all agree that it was the, one of the most spectacular and spectacularly golden things anywhere in Europe. Since its destruction, at which point almost every single trace of the shrine was obliterated, the question of what it looked like, quite how fabulous it was, is one that a few historians have attempted to answer. And there have been several attempts at reconstruction drawings capturing the form of the shrine, particularly what the shrine and the shrine base looked like. The team at the University of York, of which I was a part, were the latest to attempt this, but the first to use digital technology in attempt uh, in an attempt to generate a near photorealistic model, and also the first to show the shrine not just as a piece of architecture, but in use by medieval pilgrims as part of animated videos. Between 2014 and 2017, a team at the Centre for the Study of Christianity and Culture at York, led by Dee Dias, undertook an AHRC funded project on which I was the historical research assistant, looking at the relationship between pilgrimage and cathedrals in England, both historic and contemporary. And as part of the project, we had funding to create digital models showing the pilgrimage experience of Beckett Shrine in medieval Canterbury Cathedral that could be used both as research tools for historians and to help with visitor interpretation in the cathedral today. This was very much a collaborative project. I provided most of the historical research. Louise Hampson contributed to the design aspects. The shrine model was built by Anthony Mazington, who also did a lot of architectural research on the form and style. The chapels were modeled and textured by Jeff Arnott and Pat Gibbs and Lit as well, very importantly. And Jerome Rogers Blake did a lot of the animation work. So the models are a real team effort. Uh, and there are a lot of decisions that had to be made along the way. Three years of research went into producing these. And I could talk about almost any aspect of them for as long as you like uh, and have previously, but I'm, but I'm going to focus uh, in this instance on how two objects, which can be seen in the British Museum exhibition, provided evidence for the models. First is a pilgrim badge from Canterbury of the 14th century, which shows Beckett's shrine side on from the south. Um, so actually, the one that's in the exhibition is in the top right, uh, the fragment of the badge showing the shrine casket and Beckett figure is the one in the exhibition. Um, there, this is a very common form, they all look roughly similar but with enough, uh, I mean you can see all three badges are actually they look very similar but they are different. They're clearly different moulds, uh, they have different elements but they are so similar to each other that they are all basically representing the same thing and fairly accurately. Um, I'm actually going to use uh, one from the Museum of London because it's very complete. Um, on the right there is our shrine reconstruction, untextured, uh, which is on Sketchfab, if you want to go on Sketchfab um, and find it, which is called Untextured Shrine of Thomas Beckett. Um, this is just to show uh, exactly what we did with, with this badge and how it relates to the model of the shrine that we made. This Pilgrim badge is the best piece of visual evidence we have for the look of the shrine corroborate a lot of what we know from fairly voluminous documentary evidence and eyewitness accounts. The shrine stood on a marble base, around seven foot long by seven foot tall and four foot wide. Around the bottom was a, a catfoil uh, frieze, and this pattern can be found running around the sills in a number of places in the east end of the cathedral and is contemporaneous with the building of the Trinity Chapel. Uh, the marble base itself is indicated on the badge to have had a number of arched fair niches where pilgrims could kneel, place their heads and pray to the saint. On top of this, we can see Beckett himself on the badge dressed in his archiepiscopal regalia. It's previously been suggested that this might have represented an effigy on the shrine, but really the badge is acting as an exploded diagram of the shrine as a whole. The badge is doing something the pilgrim could not, which is to lift up the golden casket and see the saint in his repose. In reality, the body was completely concealed by a golden box. Uh, around six foot long, two foot wide and three foot tall. This was made of plates of gold stretched out over wood to give it firmness of structure. 
which was then covered in a lattice of gold wire to which jewels, gems and precious objects were attached. Prominent on top of the later medieval shrine were two medieval, there were two golden ships given as thank offerings for safe crossings of the English Channel by Edward III. Particularly prominent on the south face of the shrine, you can just about make it out on both the badge and our reconstruction, um, was a large red gem, a carbuncle, which had been presented to the shrine by King Philip II of France at around 1216. It was known as the Regal, the crown jewel of France. This is mentioned by numerous eyewitnesses. It was believed to have grown under a unicorn's horn and been owned by Charlemagne. Uh, it had magical powers, it glowed in the dark. Um, in reality, it was probably about as big as a quail's egg, but its golden setting and the flickering candlelight would have made it seem much bigger. To hammer home its importance, a golden statue of an angel stood on the shrine and pointed to the gem with a golden wand. And this is shown both on the badge and our model. And this brings up already ideas of, I mean, on both the badge and the model, this gem doesn't look all that special. How do you recreate that feeling of it being magical and mysterious and big when it's not very big? And th these are some of the things we've got to start, you know, we were having to think about when we were making the model. How do you pop, make these things pop? The badge provides excellent visual evidence for the shrine, but it shouldn't be taken at face value entirely. The form of the prayer niches, for example, are markedly 14th century. In much the same way that artists depicting Christ's crucifixion or indeed Beckett's martyrdom would update the clothes and weapons of the figures to reflect contemporary fashions, so the artists who depicted Beckett's shrine in badges felt the need to show it conforming to the architectural styles of the present. Another highly fragmentary depiction of the shrine survives in the 15th century stained glass of Nettlestead Church in Kent and accordingly shows the prayer niches of that base in 15th century style. Um, in fact, most Engli uh, major English shrines were rebuilt at some point in the 14th and 15th century because fashions for higher and more elaborate bases made 12th century shrines look outdated. And this has also been, Sarah Blick suggested that it might have been um, rebuilt in the late 13th or early 14th century. We've argued, um, that, and, I, and I think quite convincingly, hopefully, that Beckett Shrine was never rebuilt. We certainly have no evidence of Beckett Shrine ever being rebuilt, um, documentary at least. The, the marble base remained the same from its construction to its final destruction in 1538. And the second piece from the British Museum exhibition uh, helps us to understand uh, not only the particular decorative form of the shrine base, but also shows us why the base was never rebuilt. This is a double capital of rose pink marble with white flecks, found in 1983 in the River Stour, which runs through Canterbury. Together with two other capitals like this, found in the Stour at the same time, and around eight small fragments of the same marble found around the cathedral, this is probably all that's left of the medieval shrine. Whether this is actually part of the shrine has been disputed. I mean, these things have been known about for a while, but this particular marble is only found in the capitals, columns and flooring of the Trinity Chapel around where the shrine would have been. And it would all have been shipped as a consignment in around 1180. This is continental marble. The firm association of this high quality marble with the work on the Trinity Chapel and the similarity of the carvings on the capitals to those of the capitals of the uh, chapel indicates that not only do these marble fragments belong to the only pink marble thing in the cathedral which hasn't survived, the shrine base, but that the shrine base was made as a piece with the chapel around it. Presumably in the 1180s, uh, from the style of the carving, we'd think the 1180s, it shared the same building materials, it shared the same masons and the same decorative schemes. We know that when other 13th century shrines such as St Etheldreda at Ely and St Edward the Confessor at Westminster were built at the same time as the chapel in which they were to sit, then they were made to look part of an architectural whole with the chapel. For Beckett's shrine at Canterbury, the capitals confirmed this was the case. And so when we were designing the shrine base in our reconstruction, we looked to the surviving architecture of the Trinity Chapel to get our cues in terms of decorative schemes. I think it says something about the quality of the material and the workmanship. This is extraordinarily expensive marble, but also that the base was so much of a piece with the rest of the chapel. It was an entirely integral part of the chapel that it had to be preserved as a whole. And unlike other medieval English shrine bases was never rebuilt or renovated. 
One question to resolve for this piece of marble is how did it end up in the River Stour? It's not a great provenance for tying it to the Beckett, for Beckett Shrine, surely. Um, well, all the capitals, uh, the, the, the three capitals, display marks consistent with having been struck with sledgehammers or crowbars, as we'd expect from something that had been violently destroyed by Henry VIII's men. Uh, Lloyd mentioned he had the e uh, this email, his letter from um, the wife of the person who discovered it, and uh, this was the first time I'd been able to pinpoint exactly where they discovered it, and it makes perfect sense to me now, because when they were found in uh, 1983, it was in this spot here. Uh, just on the left. Um, I've, I've put it on a, another of the Centre for Christianity and Cultures, uh, something, that, uh, something else that I've worked on with them, uh, our, our outputs, which is a digital reconstruction of the city of Canterbury as it would have looked in the mid 15th century. And you can see on that that the fine spot is immediately outside of the city walls to the north of the city. It's the closest accessible spot to the river outside of the city walls to the north. And the, the star flows south to north, so it's actually it's downstream. It's the closest downstream point outside of the city. If you wanted to get rid of a load of marble from the cathedral in such a way that no one would be able to put the shrine base back together or keep any of it as relics, but you didn't want to lug it too far, then the best course of action would be to put it on a cart and dump it in the river at this point so the current would eventually disperse it. There are too many fords and mills in town to be sure that it would just didn't wash up again. So this spot is ideal. So I think there's a perfectly good reason why you'd find it there. Basically. Now to our model, to the actual model itself, as you can see, we designed the shrine base to blend in with the surroundings of the Trinity Chapel. A lot of previous work on the reconstruction of the shrine has focused on the base or taken it out of its architectural context and looked at the architectural elements of of what the historian or the, the reconstructor thought the base and, and, and the shrine on top would look like. But by putting it in the context of the chapel as a whole, you see it as just another architectural element. It becomes quite unimportant. The blending in of the marble of the base with the marble of the chapel means that the golden shrine really pops out. It's a completely different color to everything else. You're not meant to look at the base, which might explain why no medieval eyewitness mentions the base. Rather than focusing on the particular form of the shrine, we wanted the re reconstruction as a finished item to encourage people to think about how the shrine felt, how it was experienced. So we paid very careful attention to lighting, for example. Uh, the lighting comes from the individual candles. We weren't quite able to get the blueness of the lights that would have come through the windows, but that candlelight. Note from underneath the box, the box, uh, the, the case, the wooden case that covers the shrine. Um, we've got, we've actually done that so that it would be, um, painted red and gilded. Uh, so it, it, it gives this sort of warm red gold glow back off the candles on the shrine and this sort of reflection from the, the shrine case, the golden shrine case up and back down again, creates its own sort of form of light. Um, we populated the space with people and you can see how the shrine was heavily staffed by monks and clerks who provided security and guidance. You're not really meant to get all that close to the shrine, at least not unsupervised. The shrine we suggested is surrounded by grills. There, we think we've seen evidence for this against the pillars of how these were bonded to them. Many pilgrims might not get beyond these, but would have to peer at the shrine through these impediments. You, you only ever glimpse it. So all the elements of it in the candlelight and the glimpse uh, become magnified. That's why this, these tiny jewels, when you're really staring at them, seem so huge. Votive offerings, were, by comparison with other places, were probably pinned to the grills, meaning the saint's shrine would be seen through a curtain uh, of evidence of, of Beckett's efficacy as a miracle work. Rather than confine ourselves to just stills of the shrine, um, it's not just a sort of glorified digital, not just glorified reconstruction drawing. Uh, and what you would see um, in at the British Museum exhibition is the animations we made. And this actually cost a huge amount of money and was where a lot of the resource went, but we wanted to show how people would interact with the shrine uh, and move around the space. So this is the video that is shown uh, at the British Museum exhibition. And I'll just talk you through some of the things we've done to finish off. So here you see the shrine, we get it from two different angles. We get it from this isometric angle and this pilgrim's eye view. Um, you can see uh, pilgrims kneeling in the prayer niches and praying at the side. A monk invites two of these um, 
uh, one of the groups of pilgrims up who has an offering to give. We suggest that this is a, a naval captain giving thanks for deliverance of his ships in, uh, from sea wreck. Uh, you can see the North Isle uh, on the left there is a clerk pointing out the miracle stories in the windows. The windows aren't exactly correct. We weren't aware of what we know now from Lainey and Rachel's work, but we could hopefully change those around. Um, in the South Choir Isle, uh, sorry, sorry, South Ambulatory Isle, you can see um, some other pilgrims milling around, looking at the windows again, seeing things, seeing, looking at the Tomb of the Black Prince. Here a couple uh, with a child come up. The child has been saved from sickness through intercession of Thomas Beckett. They off place it on the altar, give their offering and uh, go back. And in, at the very rear, um, you can see, I'll just pause it. So you can see just at the very rear, um, if my cursor is working, you can see uh, the prior possibly talking to a middle-class couple and he's pointing out the jewels on the altar. He's naming the donors with the idea that they will give something uh, that will be of enough value that it will be pinned to the shrine. And then in future, they will be named as donors. They would enter this sort of confraternity. Uh, of, um, of of Thomas Beckett, effectively, the, the donors and, and devotees around the shrine. So that's what you'll see if you go, if you were able to go to uh, the British Museum exhibition. They are also available on our website, um, uh, which I shall, uh, which I've got at the bottom there, the Beckettstory.org, um, uh, along with all our other material that we do. Um, so as I said earlier, the, the reconstruction was intended to be both a heritage interpretation tool and a research tool. And from fairly early in the process, we worked with Naomi and Lloyd to see how we could work our digital reconstructions into the space of the exhibition. And here is the, uh, the um, reconstruction shown alongside that surviving capital. We were delighted that our reconstruction uh, does form a part of the exhibition. Um, bringing another bit of medieval Canterbury to the British Museum and hopefully allowing visitors a glimpse into the pilgrimage experience at the shrine. As a research tool, it also puts forward several new ideas about how the space was used and experienced. And I put a lot of those in my uh, Journal of the British Archaeological Association article on modeling the shrine. And our hope was uh, always that by presenting the material in this way, not that we're saying that this is exactly how it looked, but we could provoke discussion, we could provoke questions, new ideas and feedback about Beckett's cult, about medieval shrines in general, and about what's going on here. So with this in mind, I'll hand back to uh, Beth for the questions and discussion. Thank you. Um. Thank you, John. That was uh, absolutely amazing to see what you've been able to do uh, with digital modeling to help us really understand what that very famous shrine that all of us um, would have loved to see in the Middle Ages, uh, kind of give a sense of what that experience might have been. Um, I want to thank all the presenters for generously sharing their work and their knowledge and their time with us. Um, like I said, I think this is a, a wonderful example of a collaboration between curators, members of academia, conservators, all working together on a single project. I know that we all have lots of questions, so I'm going to ask Regan to open up the chat feature. I'll be moderating um, the questions in the chat, so please place your questions there, and I will pass them along to the, um, to the various speakers. Um, I, you know, am happy to start. I have a question actually for um, Naomi and Lloyd. Um, what has been the public reaction to the exhibition, especially in this time of pandemic? What have your numbers been like? What, what kind of response are you getting? Naomi, do you want to take that? Yeah, um, that, that's an interesting question. And um, I guess I'll point out a, a few things. It's quite interesting The there's a small group of questions that we get quite frequently. Fortunately, the work of some of the other speakers today have been able to answer that. One which comes up all the time at the end of public talks is, um, why is he called Thomas a Beckett? And John actually spoke about that at the Leeds conference a few weeks ago, so now we have a very convincing answer to tell people. Um, we also often get questions about the glass, technical questions about the install, the difficult difficulties of it um, are of real interest to people. How heavy is it? How long did it take to install? Um, some people have even asked if it is the real glass and if it's a big photo. So it's quite interesting that there's a sense of wonder and with some people almost disbelief that, that it's actually in front of them. 
in terms of the public reception more broadly, um, it's been very good. Like I said, it, when we were talking, all the press has been very positive, which is great. And it's very gratifying, of course, as a curator and for the whole team to get that sort of external feedback when you've been working on something so closely. Um, but there has been one very interesting element, which I'll just highlight. And this came up in an article in the Times, I guess about a month ago, and it included a photo of lipstick marks and kiss marks on uh, one of the cases. It's a case that contains a copy of the Gloss Gospels, which it's thought was owned and commissioned by Beckett. It's on loan to us from Trinity College, Cambridge. And the article was about visitors venerating objects in the show. And of course, Beckett is still an important saint today. And that's something that was not unexpected. Uh, people from all different faiths and belief systems venerate objects in the British Museum all the time, and they did so also in Treasures of Heaven. But uh, there's something of a difficulty there, I suppose, with COVID, of course, because um, uh, kissing cases is not uh, necessarily akin with um, social distancing and not touching things. So there's an interesting balance there with um, how you do with visitors sensitively and, of course, respect uh, their behaviours, but also um, being safe as well in the space. So th those are some of the takeaways, but we're getting a feedback all the time. Every Monday we get an email that summarizes all the feedback from the week from different channels. And that's always very interesting, especially if we see that celebrities have been to the show and tweeted about it. So I always look forward to Monday morning when we get our visitor insights email. The only thing I, I'd add to that is just the numbers uh, question, uh, which is the, the numbers have been um, amazing. We're actually 134 percent over our projected visitor target for the exhibition, which is um, which is very, very good. Um, and then to Naomi's point about kissing cases and things like that, we we have some of the members, the kind of friends of the British Museum, who come to see the show. Apparently, have recently been experiencing their own Beckett miracles connected to the exhibition. Um, the miracles are all relatively lame. They're things like found a wallet that they'd lost or reconnected with a lost friend and that kind of thing. So um, I don't know if, if, if uh, Leonie is thinking about making any stained glass windows, uh, incorporating those miracles in, but that would be interesting. Oh, I don't think they quite qualify yet. <laughs> <laughs> There's a limit. Thank you for those stories. That's wonderful. I, I'm wondering whether we can consider the catalog to be the modern version of the um, uh, take away um, souvenirs um, that John was showing us. So um, I think that's an interesting way. We all want to take away something from these experiences, whether we're in the Middle Ages or today. Um, a few questions appearing in the chat. I'm delighted that we have um, over 15 more minutes for questions. Um, the first one is for Naomi and Lloyd. Uh, someone's curious to know whether you attempted to borrow the Fermo chasuble. No, do you want to take that one again? Take that one because I, I actually had two years ago, two years ago and a bit, I had a very interesting and enjoyable trip to Italy to look at various uh, Beckett related objects, including the Fermo Chasuble. And at that stage, of course, when you're writing the book and researching for the book, but also um, at this creative point when you're thinking about every object available and, and what you could do, um, it was important for us to go and see every single object in person in situ that we were interested in in any way. So I went to see the Fermo Chasuble. If you haven't been to Fermo itself, do go. It's a really wonderful uh, place. But uh, from quite early on, we weren't able to consider it. And that's because of several constraints. Some are practical. Uh, it's very large. And the gallery, Gallery 35, that the exhibition is in is actually the medium sized exhibition gallery in the museum. and um, once you have one very big object in the show, like a full stained glass window, it does limit your options for other um, large objects as well. So because of space constraints, um, we weren't able to consider it in that respect. I think there's also another interesting element there, particularly with the FOMO chasuble and some of the other vestments, uh, which are how you knit it into the, the story and how you explain to visitors about um, objects which have later associations with Beckett but aren't necessarily um, original objects Beckett may have owned. And while we were developing the narrative and um, I guess tightening the story in the way that we decided to go, 
um, it was also quite difficult to work in those elements of, of Beckett's history into the narrative of the show. But of course, as we all know, there's a wealth of Beckett material, academic and in terms of material culture out there. And you could do a dozen different shows, all full of different objects on Beckett, and you'd be telling different stories. So um, yes, maybe there'll be another Beckett show in a few years time and it will feature in that. Great, thanks. Um, and then uh, we have a, a question for John, I think. Uh, we heard about how stained glass can steal the limelight from other objects in the show. I wonder whether any of you also had similar concerns regarding the ability of similarly beautifully colored and lit digital reconstructions to ask as attention stealers. Um, so it's probably a question for John in building it and also for Naomi and Lloyd in showing it within the context of the exhibition. Well, I, I think it's more of a curatorial question. I don't really, I mean, yeah, I, I, I'd plead the fifth on that. I don't know. <laughs> I'll, 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 let, I'll let Lloyd and Naomi deal with it. It's, I think it's tricky because obviously if you if you have too many uh, digital interventions in an exhibition you're you're kind of slightly distracting from the object and 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 what we want more than anything is for people to engage with the with the objects and to look closely and to think about them um, and you know too many touch screens and too many interactors can be a problem with that with that kind of thing but I think here it's it's essential to have something like this because it would be otherwise very difficult to talk about the shrine without having some kind of reconstruction. Um, and the shrine is obviously so central to discussing Beckett's cult. Uh, it was essential to have something that represented what people were joining all these um, hundreds of thousands of miles to, to see. So I think if there's a, real, a really good reason to have a, a reconstruction and, and you deal with it sympathetically and you think about the kinds of objects that surround it, then, then I think it works really well. But I think if you go over the top, of course, it's going to overpower the the objects that you're showing alongside it, and 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 so on. So, um, yeah, I mean, you you see, we, we had it on a relatively small screen. We could have gone for an absolutely enormous screen, um, but that might be problematic. So um, I don't know. It's up for grabs, really. Uh, I'll just say something very briefly about that, which is that essentially a, a piece of AV in the exhibition would still count as a piece of interpretation for us. It's an interpretation tool and also we would treat, the, treat them like an object as well. And of course the reconstruction was essential because how do you discuss a destroyed space otherwise? And it complemented the objects that were shown alongside. But that also informed the way we approached the one other piece of AV in the exhibition, which again was an important interpretation tool. That was that large um, animation, which explores the days leading up to Beckett's murder and, and the murder itself. And both the reconstruction and the animation were essential in our minds for visitors, because these were both areas where the objects do not survive to tell the story. And if you can't tell an essential part of the story through the objects, I think that's where there's a very good case for um, AV reconstructions and films, not overpowering, but complementing the narrative. Yeah, I think it's something we all um, struggle with these days as curators because so many people expect to see some sort of digital initiatives in the galleries. And it's always a question of balancing the experience of the real objects, which after all is the reason you're there with providing this interpretive material. So thank you for um, talking a little bit about that. Um, another question from Kara Morrow, has anyone considered auditory aspects of the Pilgrim experience in these reconstructions? I don't know if um, maybe some of the work that John has done included that or um, if Lloyd and Naomi thought about that in terms of the exhibition. Uh, well, I mean, I can talk talk about the, I mean, briefly about, so uh, yeah, uh, 100%. The, um, in terms of the digital reconstructions, uh, one of the arguments that I've made um, in my own work coming out of this is that a hugely important part of the pilgrim experience most pilgrims would have been there in the morning they would have been there before lunch so uh, at a time when the monks are in the choir or are uh, doing lady mass or in the, in the lady chapel there would have been when you were at the shrine the bulk of people going before uh, before lunch um, there would have been some liturgical backdrop 
uh, there would have been some uh, liturgical song, something like that, which itself, along with the lighting, along with the smell of the candles, beeswax, uh, incense, this creates that sensory experience. You are in a very different special place. Um, you don't normally hear, you know, Benedictine liturgy. And, that, and that's the kind of thing, actually, that, I mean, that's the kind of thing that creates a transformative experience that means that you are prepped for a miracle as well. Um, and this is the kind of thing, so you, you're in that headspace where you're expecting something amazing to happen. Um, we just haven't sort of slapped that on it. I think to a certain extent, because when we did, it sounded pretty cheesy. <laughs> so there's a, there's a real problem with digital reconstructions is like you really don't want to get out of uncanny, like it's uncanny value in a little bit and some you don't want to make it. You, you try it at the at the moment. It just about looks like some sort of still, you know, some sort of uh, just about. You can get the idea that this is representing exactly. As soon as you start mucking around with that, it's very difficult to do it and not make it look a bit silly. To be honest, uh, it's just a trial and error thing that we've that we found. So yeah, but absolutely, the all the the whole sensory experience and particularly that that liturgical backdrop would be really important. And Lloyd and Naomi, I know that you said that you had to make some changes to the exhibition um, after the pandemic came along in terms of uh, audio wands. Had there been an auditory experience originally planned for the exhibition in any way? We, I'll take this one if you want. The, we, we had a few different things that we wanted to do that in the end couldn't, couldn't, um, we couldn't include. One of them was we have a very early uh, um, collected uh, volume of Chaucer's poetry and we were hoping to actually have um, a listening post where you could have someone reading out parts of the Canterbury Tales or parts of the prologue. Um, we at the end of the exhibition with the with the relic we really wanted to have um, some contemporary music. William Byrd uh, wrote a piece for the martyrdom of Edmund Campion and we really wanted people to be able to listen to that when they were when they were looking at the relic because he's writing uh, you know, as a Catholic at that time, and that kind of stuff all had to go out because um, you couldn't play it loud at the same time as we have. We have music at the very center of the exhibition um, with the the animation. I can't remember if Nomi already said this, but we have the vespers that were being sung in Canterbury, actually recording that was done in Canterbury Cathedral. And you just couldn't have the sound. I mean, you, you'll know this, Beth, but you can't have the sound wave between these two rooms. It's so frustrating. Um, and I'm just trying to remember now, Naomi, if there's anything else other than that that we wanted in terms of sound in the exhibition. I mean, the thing is, very early on in the exhibition, we were keen to not treat, we wanted to treat music like an object. We didn't want to treat music like medieval music, which you often find sometimes in, in exhibitions. And so we, we collaborated with Emma Dillon, a professor at King's College, and, and some of her students to think about the kinds of music that you could include. Uh, uh, you know, not being a musicologist and not knowing about these things. So, um, but in the end, we actually, as a little plug, we have an, uh, an event on tomorrow night, uh, uh, which is an exploration of, of, of music in, in Beckett's world. And that's going to be on at seven o'clock tomorrow, or seven o'clock British time tomorrow. Um, and that's actually led by Emma, Emma Dillon and one of her PhD students, Catherine Emery, who wrote a fabulous PhD on Beckett and music. And that's going to be them talking to kind of lecture recital, talking through different, different, uh, elements of music related to Beckett, and then it's going to be a uh, sung recital by Ensemble Trouvert. So, so that, that'll be interesting if people, people want to tune in. Wonderful. Well, I'll look forward to that. Um, Melanie Hannon had a question for John. Could you please speak about what the imagery on the wooden box encasing the Bella Beckett reliquary was? I don't know if you want to share your screen again or, or just talk about it. Uh, yeah, I, I can briefly. I'll just um, just say if I'm going to see what I'm talking about. There's, there's a long answer and a, there's a short answer and a slightly longer answer. The short answer is that what we did uh, was we know that there's a case on top of the uh, a wooden case that covered the um, the shrine. Uh, it's mentioned uh, a few times. Uh, we have absolutely no idea what date it is, no idea what it looked like. So we took a Limoges chasse, we stuck it on top and we recolorized it to be sort of burgundy like the rest of the chapel. So hopefully people wouldn't look at it too hard. Um, that's, the, that's the short answer. Uh, the longer, the slightly longer answer is this really does bring up questions about what you do of authenticity and uh, reconstructions and all this. 
um, because the sort of standard good London charter, like when you're doing digital humanities, is that what we probably should have done is stuck a massive great grey box or something like that, or we should have made it see through, or we should have done something so you know, so everybody knows that this is not, and you can tell what we are sure of and what we're not, and all that sort of thing. Um, what we, we think we, everyone fudges the London Charter anyway, but what we think we the, the solution we ended up with is that if you're looking at that and that goes, that's a Lameau chasse on top of there, that can't be right, then yeah, well done, you know, that, <laughs> that it is not right. But for, um, and that's it's part of the research tool, what would it have looked like? We have no idea, whatever we put there would be wrong. We've got no way of knowing what date it is. We've got no way of knowing what it looked like. Whatever we put there would be wrong. We had to make a decision. Someone had to make a decision, but it had to be there because it's an integral part. So it's up to you, really, as you know, art historians or whatever. What do you think it would look like? What uh, different dates? Because they don't really survive either, you know. Um, but then to the casual viewer, a heritage interpretation tool at a casual glance, you just get that what we're more important, more concerned about showing or giving the impression is what the impression of the space is, what the experience of the space is, what the feel of the space is, rather than some very dry academic -y sort of precision uh, in every in every detail. So that we try to sort of have it both ways, really. And 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 the, the case the, the case above is the absolute prime example uh, of, of that of, of that that delicate tightrope that we're trying to walk. We may not have got it entirely right. But um, but it yeah it's it, it's it's obviously a lot of our historians go well that's not right but then that's sort of the point really so we 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 like it when we get questions about that because it suggests that we've done something sort of the, the, that was the idea anyway yeah good to know which parts you're sort of more sure about and which which parts are kind of your best guesses and I think we all appreciate the work you did on it because somebody has to make a decision um, there's a question from Julia for Rachel. You suggested that you're considering after the exhibition moving the uh, 19th century glass from the bottom of the window to the top, swapping it with medieval glass to make it easier for cathedral visitors to see. Is this because scholars and visitors value medieval objects more highly than those from the 19th century, or is it to offer, uh, to offer a more authentic or original experience? Oh, well, thank you. That's a, that's a really interesting question. Um, I guess the thing with Austin Jr.'s glass in this window is that it's he, all he did was to copy other medieval panels. This isn't his original artwork. Um, some of his original artwork is in the cathedral, in fact, and that's something that we're working very hard to preserve. So, um, and the other issue is that it's, um, it's so often mistaken for 13th century glass. Um, you saw that John mistakes, <laughs> made that mistake, and, and here you have a Beckett scholar, and it's, it's just difficult. So, um, I think that that um, just to um, you know to to allow visitors not to be making that mistake all the time and actually to be looking at medieval glass, I think there's a case to be made that that it would be a good move. Maybe Lainey would like to comment on that. Yeah, I, I have the greatest admiration for George Austin Jr. Mm. Uh, I think he is a true conservator and a true artist and somebody who clearly loved and understood the medieval glass of Canterbury Cathedral. So there is no ill feeling here. Um, I, I think he would probably have agreed um, to this because by the very act of just copying and not inventing anything, he's dialing his own intervention down to I'm just making fillers here. I'm not trying to reinterpret something or um, slant it in a different direction. And that is George Austin Jr. for you. He is a conservator at heart. He's trying to do minimum intervention while representing a window so that it can be read better. That, that makes sense. And I know that um, Rachel and Leone had asked for um, just this sort of question in their um, consideration of what they're going to be doing eventually with the glass. It sounds like it may be a sort of long and carefully considered process, um, but from what Le Leone just said, it sounds like he was actually, if, if he had had the information that Rachel and Leone have discovered, he himself probably would have reconstructed it the way that they are suggesting. So in a way, they are trying to be true to his intentions, even if it's not true to what he ended up doing. Um, I see that we're um, ending up with our time here. 
Um, if there is any last minute questions, I would be very happy to um, pass them along, but it's been an absolutely fabulous um, time. And I um, know that I speak for all of us when I say how appreciative we are um, to the ICMA for putting together this event, for getting a great um, lineup of speakers. Oh, and, and very good, um, Alice um, Jordan, um, who knows something about stained glass, um, has uh, one last question. It often happens that 19th century glass ends up getting reproduced more because it's easier to photograph, being in better condition. Could Leonie and Rachel speak about what they're finding of the condition of the medieval Canterbury glass? And this will appropriately be our last question today. Um, I'll take that if I may. Um, it's a really, really good question and very interesting. In fact, um, <laughs> When the 19th century reproductions, copies were made by Austin and then his nephew, um, they were actually copying the medieval glass in the condition it was in then. In the, uh, since then, uh, these, these panels have been cleaned, consolidated, uh, repaired. And so now the medieval glass often looks much clearer and much brighter than the 19th century copies of it, which incorporate all the corrosion deposits and the extra leads and you know all the damages. <clears throat> so now I think people tend to gravitate to the Victorian copies because they think, oh, they look really medievally and old. <laughs> and yes, uh, you know, uh, uh, there is that that perennial visitor question. Surely that can't be 12th century. It's in far too good a condition. When you look closely, you realize that there's a lot of corrosion damage and paint loss. But overall, our because they are such early medieval windows, they are in stunning condition. Superficially. Well, I'm sure we all look forward to um, seeing the glass both in the exhibition and in um, their reinstallation, their, their um, home uh, in Canterbury Cathedral. I see that Lloyd has very kindly added the um, link to the event for last night. So I hope that um, it will see very many of us um, at that event and in the ongoing events uh, scheduled for this exhibition. But I just, again, wanted to thank all of the speakers on behalf of the ICMA and um, really have enjoyed this time spending with everybody, seeing faces, seeing names that um, I really wish that I could see in person. Um, but this is definitely um, a very good substitution. So thank you very much for today's event. And we'll look forward to getting that email from the ICMA with the extra links so you can explore the exhibition um, even more in depth. Thanks so much. Have a nice day, everyone. Bye-bye.